Luke, what are you doing? I've been working on this for three days. I'm about done. I'll tell you in just a few minutes. Ooh, Lego. Okay, hey, today we're going to talk about design principles. Tony, what is your favorite architectural style? Now, going back into the past, we borrow that architectural past on our new homes today. What's your favorite one? There's so many different styles and design efforts with this, but I like to go to the past. Okay. I like to go to that style that started right around 1700 with the Georgian style that was named after the three different sure. King Georges of England. They have a lot of uniqueness to them because of the symmetry that's involved. They use a lot of accent pieces with brick coins and keystones. And then they have the fascias that are a little bit, you know, thicker and wider and the trim sure. that's thicker and wider and the free board that's thicker and wider that really Top make it piece work. Up there. Yeah. Yes, the big part about it though is all about the windows. The mm. windows, straight column through there. Everything is just so symmetrical and there's a lot of interesting things about those windows. I heard you got a real quick secret. You can tell me which period that was building because there's early Georgian, Correct. there is middle Georgian, and then there's a late Georgian. So which one was built in which time period? How can you Well, tell? the earliest ones are going to have the more window panes. 12 over 12 when you're looking at the window with 12 little panes and then 12 little panes. Okay. Because at those times, they couldn't make big pieces of glass. They could only do small pieces, so they had to use a lot of them together to make it work. So as time progressed, you can tell the early from the late by how many pieces of glass That's were in each one of those windows. Well, obviously, we borrow a lot of the architectural styles in how we build today. Now, I know each one of you guys picked an architectural style that you think we borrow from and use today. So who wants to start? Well, I can address the Italianate style. This is one of my favorites, and we're seeing a lot more of it even in Fort Wayne here today. Uh, it started in the 1820s to the 1860s, maybe, for popularity in just uh, regular homes, and then it became more popular in uh, businesses and things like that in the 1880s and beyond. Um, it's really marked by usually a two to three story building. You're going to have a low pitch, really dramatic, long flaring eaves. Mm. Um, you're going to have tall, thin windows with usually an arch over the top of the window. And it's just a really beautiful style. And brackets. We use a lot of the brackets Lots today in brackets. houses we're doing, almost every other house. Mm -hmm. Well, my favorite has to be the arts and crafts or the craftsman style home. And we've seen it become very popular in current days. But in the early 1900s in America, this was a very popular style. Some of the key components of it are large front porches, uh, brick and stone, shingle, wood, that's what they used on the exterior, low gables, typically a dormer, a lot of use when it comes to brackets and exposed rafters. And I just think back, you know, my grandparents lived in a house like this. I have a lot of good yeah. memories yeah. in this style of home. You know, my favorite has got to be the modern style, which we're starting to get back to. But what a lot of people might not realize is that it was brought to the United States around the 1930s. So it has been popular once before. And there's three um, distinctions in the modern home um, different styles. So you have the international modern home, which is very simple, um, more that white concrete or white stucco look, lots of windows, very, very asymmetrical, which is um, pretty fun. We have actually a couple of around the Fort Wayne area of this one here too. Um, the industrial modern, which is what you're going to see a lot of today. Uh, we see a lot of buildings going up downtown that look like this here. You can really pick this one out by the dark uh, frame in their windows. A little bit of the asymmetrical, but um, the one that stands out to me has got to be the, the wood veneer panels. You have big metal yeah, panels awesome. in different colors, and you can you can see some splashes of colors with this style too. Um, and then the last one is the, the Mission uh, modern home, and this one is going to be really long roof overhangs and mostly all glass and a little bit of wood accent too. So I really love this modern style and how many different things you can do with it. Kayla, mine kind of ties into yours. I really like the vaulted or the shed style. I think a lot of these parts and pieces kind of intermix between different styles. Some of my favorite things on the vaulted style are the really, really low roof slopes. I also like that it's asymmetrical as well, kind of like your modern style. This style tends to be elongated with long panes of glass and very stretched. It's a beautiful style that we're starting to see make its way to Fort Wayne. Yeah, we really are. It's getting very popular. Okay, Luke, you've been working a long time on this. <laughs> what are you building? Well, my favorite style has to be the prairie style. And there is no more famous house that's prairie style than Frank Lloyd Wright's <laughs> Falling Water. And I worked on this for about three days. I feel like I just nailed it. I got the, the window that's built into the stone, the piers, oh, yeah. the overhangs. I got where they wash their feet when they come in from their hiking. <laughs> I, I, got, I got it all. I mean, Frank that's Lloyd awesome. Wright, 
did an amazing job on this, and I think I got okay. it just as good. So what are you telling me? Are you saying you nailed this? Absolutely perfect. I mean, I even have it where roofs can come off, and you can see the floor plan inside. Here's my question. Have you ever been there? No. No, I've never Guess been Guess what? I just got back from there two weeks ago. <laughs> now, let me tell you what this has. In fact, I've got a picture of the waterfall that went right through the middle of the house. Wow. In fact, we're going to look at it while we're talking a little bit about it. But some of the things on the interior would astound anyone. It was built in around 1933 during the Depression. Cost on that at that time was about $200,000, a lot of money. Mm -hmm. A gentleman by the name of Kaufman built it. He is a gentleman that owned a large department store in Pittsburgh, sold out to Macy's. Anybody remember that name? Mm -hmm. Anyways, it's a beautiful home. The teak wood he used. He did have one secret that sometimes you are today, and it's called compression release. He would take you through a hallway and be very, very tight. And as soon as you came out of that, it was like a V. You would open up oh, yeah. to the, either the exterior or to another room. Everything was done on a horizontal basis, which is kind of what you find out when you built that. Everything was cantilevered, but that was a really, really, really fun project to be able to look at. We're doing a lot of that type of home right now in Fort Wayne, Kayla. In fact, mm -hmm. you're designing, I think, about two or three of them are decorating yes. as we speak. Yep. Okay, enough about the architectural style. Hopefully this will make a lot more sense as we talk about principles of design for our today's new home. We got to get started for that. So grab your material and let's meet uh, in a few seconds. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I, I, I need I, it for, I, I, I need it for, I need it Sorry. I'll start over. Welcome to Between the Studs. My name is Tony Reinke and this is the Granite Ridge Builder Team. Today we're going to be talking about design principles. We're going to get into what is aesthetically pleasing on the front of your home and what I like to call visual literacy. Tony, actually 75% of homes that are built today don't follow those five basic principles. The main reason for that is once we hit about the mid-1900s, folks stopped using professionally trained and educated architects to design their home and that's where we lost those principles. Yeah, and so what we're going to do today, we're going to define some of those for you. There's five principles. They are mass, balance, scale, proportion, and rhythm. So would you guys explain that to our audience? When we talk about mass, we're talking about taking the shapes, the squares, the circles, the rectangles that we're going to use to build a home, and we want to make sure that there are no voids. We want to make sure it makes sense and that the mass is appropriate. I kind of think of it as if we were headed on a, a pendulum like this, would the one side of the building outweigh the other side or does it all kind of balance together? Speaking about balance, that's basically we're cutting the house in half visually and does the right side and the left side look like they're in proportion with each other? It's a very simple principle, but one that a lot of people forget about. And the third principle is scale. So for in order to scale something, you have to have a point of measurement and the point of measurement is a human being, so us. So how does something feel and look in relation to us? So like a front door, for example, is it too narrow or too tall, too wide and too you know, right. short? Th those things all go into scale. It could be porches, windows, all that in relation to how we fit into it is what scaling means. And the next one is proportion. So that has to do with um, more the mathematic side of things and ratios. So what's very pleasing to the eye is more in rectangles, like two thirds, three fifths, five eighths, and that could be vertical, horizontal, but using those mathematics, it'll always be a timeless look. And with rhythm, your eyes expect to see a sequence or a continuation. So for example, if you have one column, your eye is gonna expect to see more. So based on those five principles, today we're gonna talk about streetscaping. We're gonna talk about how your house might be improved and or look based on these principles. So we've got a lot of great ideas. Stay tuned. You're going to find this very, very fascinating. All right, guys, let's okay. get ready to... Okay, we can go. Today we have an emphasis on streetscaping. That is just the way your house appears as you drive up to it. It's such an important part of your home and sometimes very undervalued. The studies actually show us that it's probably 10 to 20% of the value of your home is based just on the front entry. 
And at Green at Ridge Builders, this is really important to us. That's one of the reasons we have this great display of the front door because your entryway is so important. So this is a great visual to give you an idea of what a door will look like on your home. When it comes to your entryway, there are three different types. Mm -hmm. For your porch, we have a recessed, a flush, and a projecting. Just depends on what your home's gonna look like on the front. You want your entryway to be inviting though. So mm -hmm. you want your landscaping to lead you up to that area. Also, you want it to be easy to know where to go. So you don't want two doors on the front of your home because yeah. your guests won't know which one to enter. And there are some proportional things to consider as well. If you're thinking of a transom window above your front door, it should not be larger than the door itself. And if you're thinking of side lights, it should not be any larger than half the size of your front door. Now, Izzy, we did say that there's one entry and one important entry mm -hmm. for your guests, but actually there's two. Now wait, you just said we don't want more than one entry. We don't want to confuse people. Well, there's actually two. That second entry, it's the entry that the homeowner uses all the time, and that would be your garage doors. Okay, all right. So this is another important element when it comes to the decoration on the front of your home. Mm -hmm. You can dress that up. So if you have a craftsman style home, you could have craftsman style garage doors with some glass and maybe some hardware on those doors. But just never forget, you never have that second chance to make a first impression. And when people drive up to your home, it's so important. And it doesn't have to cost a lot of money, but it must be considered. Elizabeth, today we're talking a lot about architectural and principles on the exterior of a home. And one of my favorite to discuss is how important it is to talk about the selection of materials on the front facade. And one of our favorite rules, Kayla, is the rule of five. And when we talk about five, we talk about five materials on the exterior of the home. We do this because you don't want too much visually on the front of that home. I think they say three to four is typically the most pleasing, but you can go up to five materials. So what we're talking about there, that's referring to a brick or stone would be one. Your roof would be another. Uh, then we're talking about siding could be one more. And then depending on the decoration and ornamentation after that. So it can add up pretty quickly. And one thing that we always caution people is a lot of people like a lot of different things and unfortunately they want to put it all on one house and that's where we really violate that rule of five. We can. There's a couple other principles to consider. One of them is to keep the heavier materials on the bottom. So when you're selecting materials you want to make sure that your brick or stone typically would be underneath something that's like siding because siding looks lighter and if you had the brick or stone on top it looks like it could probably crush your, your lighter siding. So, so that's a design principle to keep in mind. Another one is to keep contrasting colors uh, to highlight your different accents. So you want to make sure that you know if you have siding and stone, you don't necessarily want them the same color because you want to provide that visual interest and contrast. So as you can see, it's so important to have professionals like Kayla here at Granite Ridge Builders to help you with all of the selections on the exterior of your home. When it comes to streetscaping, it's really all about the windows. They play a major portion of this and windows actually came around in the 17th century and they came from a term called wind holes. The house would get extremely hot and they'd want to get the natural air in there. So they actually cut these areas out of the home to let wind come in. They were wind holes then those evolved into windows. And now windows are one of the key design elements when you're looking at designing a house. That's right, the size, scale, and rhythm of the windows determines the personality of your home. There are so many different styles, sizes. Anderson actually has a book that has all of the different shapes and sizes that you can use into your home, but you really wanna be careful because if you use too many, could really mess up that look. That's right, and you wanna be careful on the proportion. We have a three, two, one rule. So for example, your windows on the bottom, those can be, if you have a two-story home, for example, those can be longer and larger. So you may have a double window on the first floor that's five feet long. Mm -hmm. When you move to the second floor, you want the window to be smaller. So you could also do a double window, but make this four feet long, so that visually it's more appealing to see the longer window on the bottom. You also wanna make sure that that your windows are on the same height per floor. You don't want to start seeing on the first floor windows starting either lower or higher than the rest. And we want to keep that balanced rhythm and scale going throughout the whole area. And like you touched on briefly, you also want to be careful that you don't want to mix too many types of windows. Right. So on the front of your home, you may have a half circle window above your front door. You don't want another shape in another area on the front home, such as an elliptical. One big thing with window placement is a lot of 
homeowners are looking at it and they're like, ah, this would be a great place to put a window from the inside of the house. And they don't really see how it affects the outside of the house by adding that window. And windows are the only piece that you do see from both the inside and the outside of the home. And that has to go with window grills. We want to make sure that we have one consistent style and design in those window grills, not mix and match those too much. Also, the grills in the front of the house are fantastic, but in the back, they may take away from your view. So we really want to take a look at those. They could, and typically we just do the grills for the looks. And the nice thing is with Anderson, they do make them so you can pop them in and out. So if you change your mind over the years, you can change the look with the grid. So many different design aspects that go into windows. That's why it's so important to talk to someone like us here at Granite Ridge Builder so we can help design that perfect exterior of your house and make sure that the window placement is just perfect. Well, Luke, the roof obviously is very important structurally when it comes to the home, but it also adds some aesthetic curb appeal as well. Yeah, the roof is the basically the cap that just brings all those other elements that we've been talking about into one unit. And uh, it can provide a lot of visual interest, uh, like you said, from the curb, but it can be done right or it can be done wrong. It can, and when we sit down with clients, it's one of the first questions we ask. What type of roof do you like? And when we talk about what type, a gable roof or a hip roof? Now what we have behind us here is a hip roof and it depends on the style of your home, usually which one you choose. Yeah, the most commons are like you said, the gable, the hip, and then a shed, which is just a simple slope. Uh, one direction. So, and I mentioned the word slope. Slope can play a big part in that visual interest and depending on the architectural style that you're looking for too. Uh, the slope can either look right with that architectural style or not look so right. So like for example, a vault is a three, we did a 312 on that and that was a very low slope and it looked right. But something like a Gothic style would maybe do more like a 1212 slope and really give a lot of roof that you see from that curb. And you have to be careful because you can do a lot of slope on a small house and then all you see is roof or if you do the right type of slope, it can make a small home look a bit larger. Yeah, we talk about that scaling or that proportion. Like you mentioned, a, a ranch style home with like a 12-12 roof pitch on it, that roof would actually make it look like it's crushing the walls. Uh, so you've got to be really careful. And we'd spend a lot of time, like you mentioned, talking to our clients and making sure everything looks proportionally correct. When you're looking at a home, you usually see about 30% of roof and you really don't want to see much more. Yeah, and we talked about those different roof styles. You typically don't want to have more than two on a house just because it will start to look busy. And then with material as well, uh, you know, sometimes we'll do a metal roof with an asphalt roof uh, just to give it, you know, a little bit different look, but you don't want to do more than probably two, again, because it'll start to look awfully busy. And, you know, the roof is a very, very important key element, but it's probably one of the last things that people think about when they're designing their house, especially from that, that front elevation. But you can see that it could change drastically how that house looks. Today we've talked so much about the design styles and principles of the exterior of the home and streetscaping. Did you know that there are 25 identifiable American styles in the United States? Yeah, and the reality is about 90% of what we build today falls under the category of eclectic. So we haven't talked about that one yet, so can you define what eclectic means? So when we say eclectic, we're really talking about the mix of a several different styles on the exterior of a home. So you can take a couple different ones like the American farmhouse and mix it with a little bit of modern. You could take Georgian and mix it with a little bit of arts and crafts, and it all still comes into those design principles. Yeah, and you said we can mix those together. It can be done right, but it can also be done very, very wrong. Uh, and all those principles are very, very important. Uh, out in the field, all of my craftsmen, uh, the framers, the siding guys, the trimmers, every single one of them, they know these principles that we've gone through and we've studied these, and they understand how important it is to get it right. And we do a lot of that up front when we meet with the client too. Exactly, we're here to help you design the style that you're looking for, and we can mix those correctly for you. We can still keep those principles intact, and that's very important. You can still mix your styles, get the flares that you like to do, and keep those principles correct. As we talk about the elevation of a home today, we get to talk about dormers, and this isn't the first time we've got a chance to do this, but I don't think we've ever explained to the audience what a dormer really is. Well, a dormer is just a pint-sized structure that's on the roof of a house. It's a little something there, kind of usually looks, looks like a small house, and it interrupts the way the roof runs. 
So dormers have actually been around since the early 1600s. Uh, they were derived from a term dormir, which means to sleep. Mm -hmm. It was actually created by a Frenchman named Mansard, who also created the Mansard style roofs, which is really popular, Second Empire styles. You'll see them at the, you know, as you walk into Disney. Mm -hmm. In that, it has a really steep four-sided roof slope. So within that, the steepest part of that, he'd, he'd introduce windows there, which would bring natural light, fresh air, and add more volume. And he did this in Paris because he had restrictions on height on what he could do for buildings, so he had to create more living space. So when we think about these dormers, though, we have principles there as well, things that we need to keep in mind when we put them on a house. One of the first one is just understanding, again, rhythm, which is what we talked about last time, that they should be evenly spaced out and shouldn't be stacked together on one side or the other. And also that alignment should be vertically, that you, should, you could have windows up on top of each other this way, but they can kind of move as long as they aren't interrupting one another. Another key principle Izzy on dormers is going to be the size. You don't mm -hmm. want them to overpower the roof lines. You also don't want them to be so tall that you can't see the main ridge line of the roof. Yeah. And probably the biggest principle is the rule of 75%. 75% of that dormer should be glazing or glass. It should not be materials. It's there again, like we said, to bring in light and to bring in air. So it should be 75% glass almost every time. And Izzy, we've been talking a lot today about rhythm. So you wanna make sure that the materials that are used on these dormers flow with everything else yeah. you've been using on the exterior of the home. So dormers can be a great thing to add. There are some principles to pay attention to, but again, come on into Granite Ridge Builders. We'll help make sure that front of the home, everything included, is gonna bring value to your home. Well, I think I'm supposed to talk about columns, but Tony's late for some reason, so I guess I have to start by myself. Wait, 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 like, hey, I had to change yeah, into the t-shirt that y'all got me, and look what, what this says. Does it say I'm a dork? Well, it's not, it's not dork, it's Doric. Okay. It's a column. Oh, uh, okay. Interesting choice there. Well, here's what we should do. I think first of all, we should define what really is a column. Column is simply this. It is a vertical shaft that supports some structure, like a roof. Okay. For example, another thing we should define is this. The entablature. Mm -hmm. That's what's above the column. There's three parts. We've had this before. The cornice, which is the top, mm -hmm. the frieze, which normally is a flat board, and then the architrave, which might be like a bed molding below. And there's three parts to a column. So there's the top or the capital, you have the shaft, which is the in-between, and then you have the base at the bottom. And there's a lot of different shapes and styles, sizes that columns can come in. You can do them out of different materials. So we have wood, you have masonry, which you see behind us, the brick column, which is gorgeous. We can do the columns out of steel, concrete, stone, all sorts of different ones, and they can be functional or they can actually just be faux. Okay, now my favorite part, of course, the historical, where did they come from? Back in the seventh century, the Greeks invented something called an, uh, a Doric column, get it? Okay, yeah. It was very plain and it had exactly what you said, the capital, which was the top, which is pretty basic, mm -hmm. the shaft didn't have a base at that point. Okay. That's called Doric. Normally, they had flutes. There was usually 24 channels or flutes in a column. Mm -hmm. Then in the sixth century, the Greeks and Romans came along with what we call the Ionic column. This has got a great history lesson here. Simply, it was the same thing with the flutes. The capital, it had what we call volutes, which was a circle. Okay. And I'll bet you didn't know where they came up with that idea. I don't know if I remember. Okay, think of this. The capital, which is the top part, mm -hmm. cap, it's the head. They would take a body part in a column, and the body was the shaft, okay. but the top was the head, and they would do that after oh. women's hairdress style. Yes. So that was the volute. It normally has four volutes on that. Okay. Then they came up with something called the composite mm -hmm. column. Mm -hmm. And then there was the Corinthian column. The Corinthian column came next around 3, 4th century BC. And that had a bunch of acanthus leaves and mm -hmm. some of those volutes. I remember the leaves and yep. Composite just got a little bit more innate. And then the last one, which is the fifth part of a classic order of columns, was the Tuscan went back to simply very plain, nice capital, shaft, and a base. So that's the history of how we've evolved into the columns we have today. When we're talking about columns, there's a lot of different principles to keep in mind that are very important for the front facade and streetscaping for your home. So when we're talking columns, you wanna make sure the size is correct. That's a very big thing. Yeah, and I think what people recommend, if you have a 10 foot ceiling, mm -hmm. you wanna go 10 times that for the ceiling versus the um, column, which okay. would mean you'd want about a one foot by one foot column to make it proportionally look good. If you went with an eight inch by eight inch, you might be able to do that on a eight foot height 
but you have to be a little careful. You definitely want to make sure the column looks like it is structurally supporting something above. So you want to make sure it looks like it has enough weight to support what is above it. Okay, and then you also told me, um, do we, I want an even set of columns or do I want an odd number? Very important to keep in consideration that the, the most pleasing to the eye is an even number, number of columns for an odd number of spaces. So the voids are the odd the number odds. and that mm -hmm. looks better than doing it the opposite. It does. I think that's a great tip. So there's a lot of other different things that we can do to make a porch look good, but columns tend to be one of the most important, right? It absolutely is. Now, I think there's a few other ones we want to talk about, so we can go get ready for that and okay. take a look, okay? I, know what, I still love. Uh, today we've really done so much to really help people understand that there's never a, a second chance to make a first impression with your home. So on architectural style, there's so much uh, value there. And even these Lego sets are a great example. And I gotta tell you, I know mine was probably the easiest put together, but architecturally, <laughs> it probably was the most difficult to build, the Guggenheim. Well, I had fun building the Roby house here. This is a Frank Lloyd Wright home. This is located in Chicago. It was built in 1909. Beautiful, you can take tours, but I don't know. I think I had the most pieces well, of anybody. <laughs> I got the falling water put back together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I also built another Frank Lloyd Wright, mm -hmm. uh, and this is called the Imperial Hotel. And oh, I really like, yeah, there's a story that goes with this that's directly applicable to what we do today. So uh, sometimes we experience bad dirt on lots, you know, maybe up by a lake, and yep. we actually have to put pilings underneath those houses mm -hmm. in order to support the load of the house. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright spent a lot of time over in Japan. That's where, a lot, where he got a lot of his inspiration for some of his other houses. Uh, but there was a swamp ground, and he wanted to build this hotel on him. And the local officials looked at him and said, you're crazy, it'll never never stand up to the, the swamp. So he put pilings underneath this, and they were concrete pilings, and he actually used a lot of reinforcement in there as well, put rebar in there. And there was an earthquake that came through, and all the buildings around the Imperial Hotel uh, all collapsed except for the Imperial Hotel. So he, wow. uh, he was a genius uh, ahead of his time. And again, we use a lot of that still today. <laughs> Luca, if you did those two, I got to do the White House. That tells me I'm in the right job fit. I'm not <laughs> supposed to be in construction because it took me this long just to do the White House. But I learned some cool things about the White House. There's actually 135 rooms and 35 bathrooms as I put this together. So you got to give me a little bit of credit. Uh, the White House, they, they picked the grounds in 1791. They laid the first cornerstone a year later in 1792. They selected an Irish-born architect, Joe, James Hoban, who designed it. It took them eight years to finish construction, wow. and John Adams and his wife moved in to an unfinished building in 1800. Wow. The big thing that I've learned about all this is there's a lot of education that has to go into each and every design style that we have, and that's what we do here. At Granite Ridge Builders, we are always studying, we are always in different classes, we are always learning all the different design elements, and that's why you really need to come in and talk to us when it comes to designing your perfect home. Yeah, because we've got a lot of great ideas on principles of design that we'd love to share. Hey, Jar, would you close for us? Absolutely. As always, guys, we want to thank you for spending part of your day with us. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about who we are, what we do, and why we do what we do so well, please just pick up the phone, give us a call, visit the website below. Even better yet, come in on one of our front doors. We'd love to help you build your own custom Lego set and your new home. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, you guys have played around with okay. Legos way too long. We have a real job. Luke, can I see him? No, can, no, can, 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 you're done. You're done, man. You're, I just you're done. Play with I'm the Lego. Lego and tell them they're missing the way. A dormer is like a pint-sized house that's just there to interrupt the the rhythm of the roof or the way the look of the roof structures over and take two. <laughs> really? Jar is sweating today. He doesn't want to do this. Right off the rip, man. <laughs> All right. We've been talking a lot today, Izzy, about rhythm. So you want to make sure that the materials. Dang! <laughs> For real?